Hello, I've asked you to listen to the Marseillaise, the French national anthem. And if you paid attention to lyrics, you may have noticed that this is indeed a war anthem. Um, now, the song was actually written not in 1789, but on it was composed on April 25th, 1792. And the original title was actually the war chant for the Rhine army. So it was indeed a chant for soldiers to partake in. And it concerned foreign invasions that the French army was to battle and fight fight off. And it wasn't at first a national anthem. The convention only accepted it as a national anthem by decree on July 14th, 1795, rather late in the story of the French Revolution. It was subsequently banned by Napoleon, Louis XVIII, and Napoleon III. And it was only restored as a national anthem in 1879 under the Third Republic. But what this anthem tells us is that the story of the French Revolution is indeed a story of war. And it's the story of war on the European continent, as well as a story of war 5,000 miles away in the Caribbean. So what I'd like to talk about today is to talk about the colonies and slaveries and a particular event that is only given one at most two pages of your textbook, namely that of the slave revolution in Sandemag. Now, if we go back, the colonies, which were mostly slave colonies, were a complicated issue because political leaders in Paris vehemently disagreed about their fate. And French policy frequently shifted during these revolutionary years, depending on the moment we, um, we were in, whether it be reform, revolution, or uh, republic. Now, in the colonies themselves, like Saint-Domingue, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, the conflict was also intense. White planters wanted to maintain privileges, um, and in fact, those who were known as free Blacks or free people of color, which was both a name and a legal definition, um, aspired to new rights, while African slaves, African enslaved individuals, refused to sit quietly on the sidelines. Slavery was always bound to become a contentious issue once France had declared the universal rights of man in 1789, where it, it explain that freedom, equality, and property were sacred rights. So at first, the deputies in the National Assembly that had been created sought a way to reconcile revolution and the continuation of slavery. Yet, two extremely important events took place that were unexpected and completely reshaped the course of the French Revolution. In August 1791, a massive slave revolt erupted in Saint-Domingue. Remember, it was the largest in the French Caribbean colonies. And in February 1794, in an attempt, in fact, to control Saint-Domingue, to retain control over Saint-Domingue as a colony, as well as other, such as Martinique and Guadeloupe, the French abolished slavery and the slave trade. Now, this did not clarify the situation because in fact, warfare continued on between France and its enemies, Britain and Spain over control of the Caribbean. However, after Napoleon Bonaparte took power in France, he decreed the restoration of slavery in the colonies in 1884. But his soldiers failed to retake Saint-Domingue, which won its independence as the Republic of Haiti in 18, 18, 1804. However, at the same time, slavery was re-established in the French other French colonies which remained part of France. And it was only abolished in 1848. Now, I want to give you a bit of context as to these French slave colonies, and you may want to watch um, the video lecture on the Atlantic world for some of that context, uh, lecture from last week. 
By 1789, so sugar production dominated all in the French Caribbean colonies. Um, and in fact, this meant that um, the enslaved population in these colonies doubled in 20 years before 1789. In fact, 99 slave ships arrived in Saint-Domingue in 1789 alone. And by then the ratio of enslaved um, men and women to white planters was eight to one in Martinique 6.5 to 1 in Guadeloupe and 15 to 1 in San Between 1750 and 1789, in fact, the population of San Domingue increased from 166,000 to 560,000. So this meant this was a society of extremes where in fact, men and women who had recently arrived from the African continent made up a large proportion of the enslaved workforce. So in 1799, these enslaved, uh, mostly from the African continents, represented 89% of the total population, that is 500,000 men and women. Whites represented only 6%, 33,000 people, and those known, and this is a legal category, as free people of color represented 5%, roughly 28,000 uh, people. And in fact, that category of free people of color included those who were referred as freed black slaves, as well as mulattoes, a name from the time period, which you should always write in quotation marks, which mean, which for people then meant people of mixed race. Um, free people of color could own plantations um, and could in fact also be slave owners, but they could not hold public office or practiced most professions. Um, and Saint-Domingue, were strictly regulated by the Black Code of 1685, which um, is detailed in the lecture of the Atlantic world. At the same time, to maintain order, the French government garrisoned between 4,000 and 5,000 troops in Saint-Domingue um, and hunted down those who were runaways. Um, now, because there was such a disproportion of enslaved compared to white uh, population and such harsh conditions, there were continual tensions in Saint-Domingue. Um, and despite all of this, um, French whites tried to recreate um, a society which resembled life in mainline France in Saint-Domingue. Now, what allowed this revolution, because it was indeed a revolution to occur in the Caribbean uh, colonies. Well, the news of the fall of Bastille, remember that is July 14th in 1789, reached the Caribbean colonies only in late September. This was all because of the mail going through ships. But colonists themselves were keeping track of developments in France. Um, in fact, the National Assembly had granted six deputies to the colonies because planters and slave owners wanted to have their interest represented um, in the National Assembly. Um, at the same time, a number of prominent deputies in the National Assembly belonged to the Society of the Friends of Blacks, as it was known then, which supported the abolition of slavery. And it included Lafayette, for instance. Um, now, because most refused to abolish slavery, many deputies instead argued that full civic and political rights be given to free men of color in the colonies. Um, this created a certain amount of agitation and a response from the white planters, um, who in fact uh, try to contemplate demanding independence from France as a way of preserving their own interests. Um, and it is much more difficult to know what those who were enslaved actually believed and thought because archival traces are so rare and difficult to find, but not impossible either, as historians have dem uh, demonstrated. Um, so this led the uh, National Assembly to decree in March 1790 the exemption of the colonies like Saint-Domingue 
from the Constitution and to prosecute anyone who attempted to prompt or support uprisings against the slave system in these territories. Um, in fact, a spokesman for the committee explained that France must preserve its colonies in order to maintain its commercial uh, position. And the majority of deputies, in fact, shared his sentiment. Um, now, opinions changed, in fact. Um, by 1791, men like the one uh, supporting preserving colonies, in fact, started thinking that the colonial regime was uh, problematic, oppressive, and bar uh, barbarous. And at the same time, the many newspapers that had sprung up in the wake of 79, but also the radical Jacobin clubs, started mounting um, a much more effective and loud campaign for the abolition of slavery, denouncing planters, and um, also in the process, advocating granting of political rights to men of color. Um, now, essentially a number of developments in Paris um, created conditions. Um, that is, when uh, whites began lynching, um, sort of those who were considered, and I, and I quote this in quotation marks, um, mulattoes who had demanded rights, um, um, this um, in fact created a lot of dis pleasures, especially because the French army cooperated with local planter militias to defeat and arrest those who were demanding rights. Um, so this increased violence did not go unnoticed in Paris, so much so that Robespierre, a Jacobin who would then lead the Republic, proclaimed, perish the colonies if the price is to be your happiness, your glory, or your liberty. This meant that by May 15, 1791, under renewed pressure from the Society of the Friends of Black, the National Assembly granted political rights to all, and again, these are legal categories, free Blacks and mulattoes, born of free mothers and fathers. This gave limited rights to only a few hundred men. Um, and in fact, even these decisions were thrown into confusion because in the midst of political struggle, the situation changed drastically. When on August 22nd, 1791, the enslaved men and women of Saint-Domingue rose up in revolt. This was not a collection of riots. This was in fact planned organized throughout the island and across numerous plantations, showing that in fact, those who had been enslaved had capitalized on their experience as soldiers, as political leaders um, back on the African continent, and in fact, on um, cultural ties in order to organize and to mount uh, a sustained collective effort. Now, the signal was reportedly given by a man called Bookman, who was a coach driver and apparently also um, a, high uh, a high priest. Um, within a few days, half of the sugarcane plantations near the Cap Francais had been burned to the ground. And this was incredible, uh, but also destructive. And it is not a surprise if you think of the violence of this system and of the uh, plantation system, that the destruction of the resources, the materials would have been uh, something that those who rose up um, would have undertaken. So within weeks, 100,000 men and women joined in the revolt burning down 180 sugar plantations um, in this way. So the reaction, of course, on the part of the authorities was to try and protect the plantation system. So leaders did that in a number of, of, uh, of ways. For instance, in Guadeloupe, the governor reinforced plantation patrols. In Martinique, 
white planters granted uh, um, those who were considered mulattoes the vote, um, even as they outnumbered them two to one. In Saint-Domingue, in fact, um, white planters refused to extend any uh, rights, um, and this allowed the revolt to spread. So much so that the French plantation owners appealed to the British governor of Jamaica for help and the planters blame abolitionists for the revolt. In fact, in the hope of gaining support, the new legislative assembly back in Paris finally granted civil and political rights to free men of color in March 1792. The deputies recognized this was an unprecedented and dangerous um, situation. Um, and even though it left slavery untouched, and showed determination to put down the slave revolt by dispatching 6,000 men from, uh, from France, white uh, uh, planters decided um, to uh, form an alliance with free men of color. So after France declared war on Britain in January uh, 1793, remember that it was already at war um, in 1792 with Austria and Prussia, um, the white planters in both Saint-Domingue and Martinique made agreements with British, the British government to declare British sovereignty over the island, while Spain offered freedom to those who had uh, uh, rebelled, um, that is, those who were formerly enslaved. And Britain invaded Martinique in June 1793, while Spain invaded Saint-Domingue from across its common border. So by March 1794, British, the British had gained control of both Martinique and, and Guadeloupe, while those who had rebelled and were formerly enslaved joined the Spanish army in droves so that the French troops were clearly unnumbered. So what you have is indeed European competition over who can hold control over these profitable slave colonies taking place at the same time. Um, and in fact, it's important to keep in mind that while those who revolted, and this was a revolution fueled notably by the conditions of slavery, but also the ways in which um, those who had been enslaved had appropriated and reframed French political culture. It is important to know that the French declaration of man and citizen was translated into Creole. But it's also important to remember that those back in Paris who made decisions made decisions not necessarily out of pure political principles, but out of self-interest in order to preserve their colonial holdings. So to prevent complete military disaster, the French governor in Saint-Domingue formally freed all those who were enslaved in August 1793. He did this without permission of the French government in Paris as a way to ensure loyalty to the French government on the part of those who had been enslaved. In February 1794, overcoming fears that abolition was a British plot, the National Convention in Paris formally abolished slavery and granted full rights to all black men in the colonies. This, in fact, had the desired effect in that those, especially generals who had joined uh, Spain, returned to join the French army. And one figure is the uh, very important and significant Toussaint Louverture. So in summer 1794, the French gradually retook Martinique and Guadeloupe um, um, at this particular moment. And in 1798, the British negotiated their withdrawal directly with Toussaint Louverture. The French government appointed Toussaint Louverture governor in Saint-Domingue as a reward for his efforts, but he had effectively established control without the French government and remained committed to the principles of revolution and a revolution that had been incredibly bloody. A third of those who were enslaved had died fighting. He remained in charge until 1802 when France's new leader sent 16,000 soldiers to regain control of the island. The French 
government then arrested Toussaint, who died in prison in 1803. And this new leader, Napoleon Bonaparte, who intended to restore slavery, did so successfully in Martinique, in Guadeloupe. But he failed to recapture Saint-Domingue and declared its independence. Um, and Saint-Domingue declared its independence as the Republic of Haiti on December 31st, 1804. Now, there are historians who have managed to give a sense of what it meant for those who revolted and carried out this revolution. This revolution that was incredibly significant and that one could argue changed the course of the French Revolution and of European history back on the continent. So what would happen if we think of what happens in France of the French Revolution taking it into account and starting from the point of view of the Caribbean? What happens if we think of those who had been enslaved as having a political mind of their own and in fact having political demands um, that they wanted to enact? And let's think of the ways in which um, those back on the continent essentially made a decision to abolish slavery in order to preserve colonialism. So these are the questions that will haunt French politics and the unfolding of European history after the revolution that was called by the incredible historian and thinker CLR James, the revolution of the black Jacobins. Thank you.